Oi, looks like it might be time to put another Aussie horror movie on the Barbie, eh? Crikey. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Horror Movie Syllabus. My name is Professor Victor, and I'll be your host as we go through all of the essential, noteworthy, interesting, and notorious modern horror films. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out the introduction video. There's a link to that in the description below, and it'll give you a pretty good idea of what we normally do at the Horror Movie Syllabus, which is we look at a particular subgenre of horror, and then we pick three movies from that subgenre to explore. In this series, though, our doctorate series, what we do is we recap a previous subgenre that we've done before. We do a quick recap of what we talked about in our previous video, and then we add a fourth doctorate level selection, something that's a, maybe a little bit more deeper cut, a little lesser known movie uh, to the conversation, to the subgenre, something else to talk about, something else to explore. And as you've probably seen in the thumbnail or seen in the title of the video, what we're re revisiting today is the Australian horror subgenre. And this was one that I really loved and I do love. Australian horror is the bee's knees. It's great. Uh, this was something that I even talked about this in the previous video, which, by the way, I'll, link, I'll leave a link to that in the description below also so you can revisit it. It's definitely worth watching. We talked about some really amazing movies. The, the, the Australian subgenre is something that I came up with when I was making the syllabus and decided to flesh out international or foreign uh, movies into different regions. And I, I picked Australia as one of them and was stunned by just how many good movies come out of Australia uh, and how intense they are. We spent a lot of time talking about the intensity of these Australian movies and how they don't really reflect like the Americanized idea, uh, like the Crocodile Dundee idea of Australia. They really are something a little bit more visceral, a little bit more realistic, uh, oftentimes based on real life events, real life, uh, you know, murders or true crime stories, things like that. Uh, and, and we talked a little bit about the history of Australian horror and, and you know, the Ausploitation movement in the 70s, the Australian New Wave, and how it's leading us to what we have today in terms of this wide breadth of, of Australian horror that is just really rich and deep and diverse, frankly. Uh, and that's one of the things we highlighted in looking at the movies that we looked at in that video some really diverse Australian horror movie choices. Uh, so let's go ahead and recap those choices right now. The first Australian horror movie we discussed was Dead Calm. And I really stress that Dead Calm was an underrated or overlooked uh, Australian horror thriller movie that was it doesn't get the love that it should get. It should really be more memorable. A, because it's just a really fun, good movie that's got a lot of good tension in it. And B, because it's an amazing cast. We talked a little bit about Sam Neill and how he's kind of like the MVP of horror movies. He's just kind of an underrated actor when it comes to horror movies. But we also spent a lot of time talking about Nicole Kidman in one of her earlier roles. And she really is fantastic here. We talked about like, the love we have for her on the channel as a bona fide screen queen, but how good she is here in one of these fresh faced new roles and how she really makes an impact on both the movie and on on audiences because look at the career she's had since then it really is an underrated movie that you know shows some really quality acting and has a lot of fun and just really doesn't seem to be uh well appreciated enough so we had to shout it out on the channel the next movie we talked about was lake mungo and we talked about how Lake Mungo was probably the best of the After Dark Horror Fest movies. And it really is an outstanding example, probably one of the best examples of mockumentary horror, but also one of the best examples of Australian horror. And that's why we wanted putting in the Australian video rather than the mockumentary video, because it's just that good. And it does have a really strong reputation amongst people who've actually seen it. People tend to really like this movie and extol its virtues, but it just doesn't seem like it has gotten a widespread viewing. People don't really seem to find it as easily as they, they should have. Uh, and we wanted to highlight that and, sh and shine a light on it. And we also kind of recommended that if you could trick your friends into watching it and thinking that it's a real documentary rather than a mockumentary and to see what kind of reactions you could get out of them. That would probably be a lot of fun because it's so well made as a, as a documentary uh, that, that it really could fool people and really have a really fun experience for those who didn't know what it was about or that it was an actual, you know, mockumentary horror film. Probably a lot of fun. So if any of you have actually done it since that video, leave it in the comments below. But that one, if you haven't seen Lake Mango, it's a must see. It's absolutely incredible. And the last Australian horror movie we discussed was Wolf Creek. 
And Wolf Creek is notorious as being a pretty brutal and graphic and violent Australian horror film, uh, loosely based, very loosely based on some real life killing of hitchhikers out in on the Australian desert. And uh, it's really noteworthy for that, but it's also noteworthy for the character Mick Taylor, the iconic killer Mick Taylor, portrayed by John Jarrett, uh, who really stands up, you know, amongst some of the greats, honestly, you know, you know, the Freddy Kruegers and whatnot uh, of the horror genre. And we we talked about that in the video, how that that character has endured enough to turn a whole franchise out of this movie. But the movie itself, just the, the individual first movie itself is pretty brutal. It really lives up to its reputation. It really is a rough watch. Gives it that that oomph, that that really visceral uh, like intense and realistic uh, and somewhat gory uh, thing that, that Australian horror is kind of becoming known for. And, and it really is a gut punch of a movie. And not for everybody because it's tough to watch. But when you're talking about Australian horror, you can't not talk about Wolf Creek. So those are the movies that we looked at in our last video on Australian horror. But now it's time to look at our doctorate level selection. Our doctor level selection for the Australian horror subgenre is Hounds of Love. Hounds of Love came out in 2016, and I really can't explain to you what the title of that movie means, other than maybe there's some sort of connection to the Kate Bush song. Uh, maybe, I guess. <laughs> but the movie does reflect the brutality and intensity that we were talking about when we're talking about Australian horror. It's uh, maybe a lesser known movie than something like, say, Wolf Creek, but it has no less of a visceral impact or emotional gut punch. And the fact that it, like Wolf Creek, is loosely, maybe less loosely, based on real life events is probably a big part of what makes it hit as hard as it does. Now, if you haven't seen it before, the movie is the story of a couple that cruise around and kidnap young women off the streets uh, usually teenage girls, frankly, uh, and they kidnap them and keep them in their home uh, bound and they sexually torture them and then ultimately wind up murdering them. And they do this serially. They, they have done this multiple times. And this movie focuses on one particular victim who manages to escape. And that is, you know, where it's been kind of based on reality uh, and also kind of diverges from reality as the way they approach this is interesting to say the least but i'm going to stop there so it's not spoil the movie for you but we are going to kind of talk about this a little bit because the movie is you know ostensibly based on a couple of different kinds of murders out in australia but primarily it's based on the morehouse murders and the morehouse murders was a couple named david and Catherine bernie who did exactly this they would kidnap young women they kidnapped uh, i think five different women between the ages of i think 15 and 30 something like that the numbers i may be off on the numbers a little bit but young women and they would take them home and, and rape and torture them for a few days and then ultimately kill them and dispose of them out like bury them out in like the australian woods or whatever uh, and they were caught when one of their victims managed to escape and lead the police back to them. Uh, a woman named uh, Kate Moore, or Moore. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right. Apologies if I'm not, because she's a, she's a damn hero for, for, for pulling this off. And that's where this movie gets interesting and maybe even a little bit controversial. Because while the movie does, in broad strokes, follow that story uh, of Kate and her escape and her survivor story, it really focuses specifically on the female of the of the duo killing, who's not named Catherine. They changed all the names in the, in the movie, uh, again, because they're not doing a straight adaptation. But they focus more on her and also on the victim as well. But really, a lot of focus paid on, on the wife of the, you know, the husband-wife killing duo. And that is controversial, but it's also what makes this movie so interesting to me. Because by sympathizing with her as another victim of this man who's kind of the you know the orchestrator of this scheme it's it's highlighting this situation where sometimes these people who are uh you know a duo one of them is more dominant than the other one and the other one might be a victim as well now i don't know enough about the the bernie case the morehouse murders to say that this is an accurate depiction of Catherine bernie i really don't know and i get the impression that it's probably not but it's an interesting attack, uh, angle to, to attack this movie from because it, it, it makes it hard for you to figure out who you're rooting for. You are clearly rooting for the victim. 
clearly you want her to escape you want her to be okay the movie is very good about showing you the ordeal that she's going through in a way where they they leave a lot off to your imagination a lot of the, the actual violence and stuff is implied and happens off screen but they imply it so heavily so strongly that maybe that's even worse like it's great to not have to see this brutality on screen but leaving it to your imagination and kind of hinting at what's happening might be worse because your mind can really go some dark places, or at least mine can. So that's a very effective way to make this movie feel even more intense and more brutal and more gruesome than it actually is. It's kind of like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where your mind is filling in the blanks and you're actually not seeing as much on screen as you feel like you're seeing. Hounds of Love pulls off a similar idea by showing you aftermath, showing you close-ups of tools and things like that, and not really showing as much of the actual act. That said, it shows enough to make you feel wildly uncomfortable. This movie is extremely well made, and it, it does a good job of ratcheting up that uncomfortableness, the tension, the intensity is, is, is palpable in, in, in the way it's shot, everything. Tip my hat to the director because it's a really well-made movie that really puts you right in that house with them and makes you feel just so uncomfortable and tense and like you're watching something you really shouldn't be watching. And that is watching this young girl, she's a teenage girl, being just tormented. And yet, while you're, you know, feeling for her, you're identifying with her, you're, 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 you care about her, you're also seeing it from the perspective of this woman who's abused. There's no way, other way around it. She's abused. She is complicit. She is taking part in this. She is doing things that are horrible. No doubt about it. And yet you find yourself feeling sorry for her because you can see the manipulation. You can see that she's not really super on board with what's going on, at least not at this point anymore. And, and, and yet she doesn't see a way out and she's She's so abused and beaten down and then she's so willing to tolerate and put up with so many bad things that it's shocking. And you really want her to find a way through it and, and, and turn the tables, not only for the sake of the victim, but for her own sake as well. You want her to come to that realization, to get her head out of her butt and realize how bad the situation is. It's frustrating and amazingly interesting. Again, I couldn't think of too many movies that took this angle where they made one of the villains so sympathetic that you're almost rooting for her as much as the victim. And that also is kind of uncomfortable because you don't really want to sympathize with her. You want to just paint her as a monster like he is. But she's more complicated than that. And this movie doesn't give you that easy out. And the movie doesn't necessarily follow true events uh, in terms of Kate Moore's original story to its de detriment and to its benefit. Benefit because uh, I think that it allows it to explore this whole angle about a sympathetic villain and make this movie stand out from any other kind of, you know, serial killer type movie. But uh, to its detriment in the sense that it does undermine a little bit Kate Moore's uh, actual survivor story, which is amazing. You should check it out. Because she she was not there very long. They, they screwed up early on not locking her up and she was able to get out through a window. And she was able to lead the police back to them because she she had done a little drawing in the house that they could actually find and prove that she had been in the house. And she was able to get the address and, and the name of the people off of a pill bottle, even though they were lying with their names. And, and this is some of this stuff is actually shown in the movie, too, but it's done in a way so it doesn't work the same way. And she's uh, largely I, well, I don't want to spoil how she gets out, but it's not the same way. She's there longer. More stuff's done to her. And she doesn't. Uh, she doesn't get to, like, they show a lot of the things that Kate Moore did. They don't work as well in the movie. I'll say it that way. Uh, and so, to me, it kind of undercuts a little bit of, of how amazing she was for being able to escape the way she did. But the benefit being you get this other angle of the 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 wife, this abused wife, and, and her inner turmoil of how to deal with this. Fascinating stuff. A fascinating psychological exploration of two different women, two different abused women being abused in a different way who have a shared experience. Uh, really interesting angle, and they do a great job with it. It's what makes this movie stand out as something really fascinating, really interest, interesting. And it explains why the critics love this movie. It really is uh, one that gets a lot of praise. But again, not one that's seen a lot, and I can understand why. It's not going to be for everybody. It's a rough watch, and the fact that it's real is rough too. Uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely something, you know, think about it. Think about whether or not you want to watch this movie, but it's really, really good. It, everything but the, the performances across the board especially the two women both of them crush it in this movie absolutely excellent so it's it's definitely one to see 
but again, be mindful of, of what you can stomach uh, and the fact that it's based on real stuff. And it's, like I said, more than Wolf Creek. It's, it's based really more closely on than Wolf Creek on real life events. So uh, I'll take all that in consideration. But if you have the stomach for it, check out Hounds of Love because it is an amazing movie that will just really gut, you, uh, gut punch you. So check it out. So that's our doctor level pick for the Australian horror subgenre, but we've got another extra credit for you because, again, I love these movies and I think they warrant being talked about quite a bit. The extra credit movie I want to mention to you is Road Games. And Road Games came out in 1981, and it's interesting because it is set in Australia, it was made in Australia by an Australian filmmaker, but its two lead stars are American, Stacey Keach and Jamie Lee Curtis. So that kind of makes it a weird choice for this Australian horror subgenre, but it's such an underrated movie that I wanted to shine a light on it, so this is my opportunity to do so, and that's what we're going to do. Now, if you haven't seen it before, the movie is about Stacey Keach's truck driver who's traveling across the country to deliver a shipment of meat, and he witnesses uh, some strange events happening with a guy in a green van and, and a hitchhiker, and he hears about this serial killer who's been picking off hitchhikers uh, and, and, and leaving a trail of dead people, dead women specifically, and he becomes obsessed with the notion of following this, this, this van that he keeps seeing on the road and trying to solve the mystery that's going on about these murders and to see what's going on. But of course, he keeps putting himself in danger as he gets closer and closer and keeps watching this guy and following this guy and trying to find out what's going on. And we'll leave it there to not spoil it, of course, but this movie is definitely underrated because I think when it came out, it was sold and marketed as a slasher film, and it's really not. It really is like a slow burn mystery thriller movie and I think if you're not expecting that, you're going to be a little disappointed. If you're expecting it to be a slasher, and again, it's 1981. It's got Jamie Lee Curtis from Halloween. You know, it's, it's kind of being marketed as a slasher. You're expecting a slasher and you don't get that. You're going to be unhappy. But if you know what to expect with this movie, I think you're going to find it to be a pleasant surprise. And that's what I find about it. Because when you realize, and I didn't realize it was intentional until I did the research for this video, but it is intentional, that this is essentially an homage to Rear Window, then everything falls into place. The movie is a Hitchcock homage. They even have like a, a reference like a Hitchcock magazine in the movie. It's, they're, they're very blatant and obvious about this, and yet I didn't realize how intentional this was, that the director wanted to make like a mobile version of Rear Window, the, the Jimmy Stewart classic where, you know, he's watching uh, across the way and he's he's in a wheelchair and he, he's watching across from his apartment and, and seeing this murder plot unfold. So... That's fascinating because I love that movie. We're going to talk about Hitchcock quite a bit in the future, by the way, and that's probably going to be on the list. Let's just say that. But the uh, the movie does a really good job of changing that setting, changing the concept, but leaving the, the, the core fundamental obsession concept in place. And that's what I love about this. You've got Stacey Keach, and I'll be honest with you, Stacey Keach, not, I'm not a huge Stacey Keach fan, but he's great here because he's really showing the idea of what a truck driver life is like, the solitariness of it, the way you kind of have to play these road games to keep yourself engaged, keep yourself from kind of going a little nuts and crazy, and how you can fixate on something and get obsessed about it. And it starts to question, make, make you make his question, like, is he an unreliable narrator? Is he kind of crazy? Or is he going crazy? Can we trust the things we're seeing on the screen? Can we trust who Jamie Lee Curtis is when she shows up in the movie? It's all interesting. It's kind of like this aspect of, like, mental health for, you know, long-driving long, long driving truckers, for big, big truckers, and how lonely they are and the solitude and, and all that. And, and it really ties into, like, is that fueling his obsession? And, you know, that goes into the rear window themes of obsession and, and, you know, voyeurism and stuff like that. It's really, really fascinating. And and it's interesting because the way they use Jimmy Lee Curtis it kind of fuels this because she kind of comes in late and she kind of pops up and comes in and out of the movie. And even the director admitted that, that he underused her. I guess she was something that the studio pushed on him because he was going to use somebody else, but they insist on having another American in there to, to financially back it. And, and, and you sort of have more widespread appeal, which it didn't. It, it bombed at the box office, unfortunately. But the fact that she gets used as sparingly as she does just kind of adds to this mystery of like, what are we seeing? Is it really uh, true? Is it really something we can, you know, have faith in? Or is he an unreliable narrator? And I think that's why this movie has developed a cult following for people who appreciate it, what it actually is doing and trying to do rather than what it was mismarketed as. This really does seem to be uh, a, a really cool experiment that I think 
mostly works, you know, and then throwing out that he's got a pet dingo on top of it. Fantastic. Loving that dingo. But I just, I think this movie's a lot of fun. I think Stacy Keach, I, at first I wasn't sure he's going to pull it off. He's talking to the dog a lot. He's talking to himself uh, and he's a little bit wacky and kind of goofy. And But then that starts to play into the movie's themes and, and what they're trying to explore. And it winds up being absolutely great. It's definitely an underrated movie for sure. I don't think people talk about it as much. but And again, I think it's because they, they lump it in with all the slashers of the era. And it's way better than that. It's way better than that. So yeah, if you haven't seen Road Games, I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, and I'm sure some of you have. And maybe some of you have different opinions to me maybe you find it a little slow uh it doesn't really work for you but i love it i love the hitchcocking aspect of it for sure i think keach does a great job i think jamie lee curtis does a great job i do think she's a little underused in there unfortunately the ending's a little bit weird but I i'm cool with it because i think that it kind of again mirrors the way that rear window ends frankly so i'm down for this movie i hope you check it out if you haven't seen it because i do think it deserves more love so that's why we wanted to bring it up and that's what we did so that's going to do it for our exploration into the, or our re-exploration of the Australian horror movies, because they're just so great. Again, uh, Australian horror movies should be a seal of approval, you know? It just gives you a good idea that you're going to see something interesting, quality, and probably challenging and pretty intense, too. Uh, so dive into Australian horror. Check out, start with the movies we talked about here. Go back and watch the original video and see the other movies we talked about for extra credit. All of that stuff's good. All of it's good. Uh, so now it's a good time to check out Horror Trivia Pursuit. Uh, again, we're going to answer a card question right here on camera and see if I can get it right. And I'm going to go with the international category because, again, we're talking about, you know, uh, international film. Here's the question. What is the profession of Aurora in 2007's The Orphanage? Okay, so here's the challenge is I... I don't really know who Aurora is. My presumption is that she is the main woman. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm going with it. But as you know, I'm terrible with names of characters and they don't explain who she is in the card because that's the whole point is you're supposed to guess the answer of what, you know, who she is in relation to, you know, her job or what, what she does. Uh, but I'm, I'm guessing it's the main character. I'm guessing, but I don't really know that for sure. But it's my best guess. Uh, and so I'm going to be going with that probably. But So if you've seen The Orphanage, then you know probably where I'm going to be answering this. And you're probably going the same path I'm going. But if you've also seen The Orphanage and you remember the names of the characters, you might know whether or not this is the right path to be going down. Now, I have a tendency to try to talk myself out of answers that are correct. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick with this. I'm kind of prattling on a little bit to give you a little bit of time to think about it yourself. But again, I think you kind of like either you've seen this movie and you know it, or you've seen this movie and you think you know it, like I do at least, or you have no idea. If you have no idea, you're just going to be guessing a shot in the dark, right? So, uh, but I am pretty sure that, uh, like, if I'm, if my thought process is correct here, then I'm pretty sure that this is a fairly easy question. In fact, it's so easy that that's what's giving me pause a little bit, is that it feels like a little too obvious or too easy of a question to, to be correct. But I'm going to, again, I'm not going to talk myself out of this. I'm going to stick with this. Uh, and, you know, we have, we did talk about The Orphanage on, on the channel. Uh, it is a very good movie. Uh, so, you know, if you haven't seen that video, you should check that out too. But, but okay, enough dawdling. Either you know it, you don't know it. Time to take, take a guess, lock an answer in. Okay, so uh, my understanding, again, if Aurora is the main character, then she's the woman who runs the orphanage. She's the one who started the orphanage to have the kid, place where the kids live. And she'd also had been in the orphanage as a, as a, as a resident, uh, as a child. So I believe she's the owner slash runner uh, of the, the orphanage. I don't know what the title would be of that, but she's the one who owns and, or, and runs the, the, the orphanage. So that's my answer. And uh, let's go ahead and just double check the card. A psychic. The card says a psychic. Okay, so that means that it's not the main character, right? Uh, that means it's some, it's the other woman. Okay, so yeah. The, so that's, I'm wrong. I'm flat out wrong because I, I again, my initial assumption of who Aurora was, was wrong. So I got that one wrong a little off today. So that sucks, but hopefully you guys got it right. And if you didn't get it right, did you make the same mistake I did? Did you assume that it was the main woman? And then now it seems so obvious that it's not, but if you got the same thing I got, let me know in the comments below. If you had another wrong answer that's particularly funny, let me know in the comments below because I enjoy that stuff. But uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up here. Uh, thanks for hanging out and revisiting Australian Horror. Again, strongly recommend Australian Horror movies. There's so many good ones. Uh, I've gone over a bunch of them, and, and there's a lot for you to choose from. So do that. Let me know how it goes. And then, you know, next week we'll come back for something completely different. But until then, class dismissed.